My name is Kay pogek Basy, and I am the founder and chief connecting officer of MeshMinds, a creative technology studio that is partnered with the United Nations Environment Programme. I am your host and moderator for today. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the exclusive premiere of Plastic, a film commissioned by Mesh Minds in collaboration with Studio Birthplace to offer hyper-realistic glimpses into a plastic polluted future through the eyes of a child from Southeast Asia. You may not know that six of the top 20 polluters of marine litter in Southeast Asia are, are in Southeast Asia, making the region a plastic pollution hotspot. Following the success of the 100 Days to Beat Plastic Pollution campaign by the UN Environment Programme's Sea Circular Project and Mesh Mines in 2021, we wanted to continue the advocacy with a short film to catalyze individual and collective action in the region. The film is supported by the UN Environment Programme and Sea Circular, an initiative from UNEP and the coordinating body on the seas of East Asia to inspire market-based solutions and encourage enabling policies to solve marine plastic pollution at source. Today's panel discussion aims to cover three key areas. First, how and why the film was made, followed by the plastic pollution crisis through the eyes of young sustainability advocates from this region. And finally, the role of large organizations and government bodies in achieving an end to plastic pollution. I'm very pleased and honored to welcome today, Ms. Isabel Lewis, Deputy Regional Director at UNEP's Asia Pacific office in Bangkok. Isabel coordinates UNEP's work in the region pursuant to the organization's mandate to support UN member states on issues related to the environment, sustainability, and the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Next up, we have Sean Lin, producer and co-founder of Studio Birthplace. Studio Birthplace is a creative studio and filmmaking company focusing on topics for a sustainable future for our planet. Next up, Kathleen Tan, co-founder of Coastal Natives. Coastal Natives is a project by Rumor Foundation, which aims to inspire new ocean lovers and conservationists. They host a range of events to increase ocean awareness and empower advocates to act for the ocean. Sydney Steenland, founder of Sea Monkey Project, Sea Monkey Project breathes new life into plastic waste by upcycling them into eth ethical souvenirs. Beyond upcycling projects, Sydney also runs workshops and conducts educational talks to raise awareness about the global plastic crisis. And last but not least, Cher Chua Lasalvi, founder of Tenga Island Conservation and Batu Batu Island Project. Tenga Island Conservation is an independent, not-for-profit biodiversity management initiative based in Malaysia. Their work involves protecting and preserving local biodiversity through scientific research, management, training, and outreach. Before we kick off the panel discussion, let's hear some words from His Excellency, John Astrom Grondal, the Swedish ambassador to Thailand, who unfortunately was not able to join us today. Only one earth. This is the theme of the World Environment Day that my country, Sweden, is hosting this year. It calls for collective transformative action on a global scale to celebrate, protect and restore our planet. Only One Earth is the same theme that was used when the first World Environment Day was held in Stockholm in 1972. Today, 50 years later, this message holds just as true. Planet Earth remains our one and only home, and we must do everything in our power to protect it. The film Plastic has a very strong message connected to this. It's time we enhance shared responsibility to end plastic pollution. Future generations must be able to enjoy an ocean free from plastic pollution, and food and water free from microplastics. This is our responsibility to solve. I am very pleased that we are taking important steps forward. Earlier this year, 175 nations backed the historic resolution at the UN Environmental Assembly to end plastic pollution and to commit to, to develop a legally binding agreement. 
The Stockholm Plus 50 meeting hosted by Sweden with support from Kenya aims to accelerate a transformation that leads to a sustainable and healthy planet for all, where no one is left behind, which also includes dialogue on how to end plastic pollution. Preparations leading up to this important meeting includes regional consultations and I had the honor myself to open the Asia-Pacific Regional Multi-Stakeholder Consultation. I was very pleased to listen to the many important recommendations from the Asia-Pacific region on how to solve plastic pollution, including innovations, legal and economic incentives, behavioral change and a circular economy. Only one Earth. Let's protect it together. As His Excellency Ambassador Grandar mentioned, we have only one Earth, the theme for World Environment Day this year, and 50 years ago when it was also hosted in Sweden for the first time. Planet Earth is our one and only home, and we must do everything in our power to protect it. Let's dive in. So turning to Sean first, when Meshwines approached you to collaborate and produce plastic, tell us what got you on board, what about the project spoke out to you, and, and you know, a little bit about your company's uh, mission and vision as well. Yeah, thanks, Kay. Um, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy that the film is finally being released. Um, we're very excited to see how far the film travels. Um, so to answer your question, um, as a creative studio, um, at Studio Birthplace, our vision is to cultivate a world where individuals and organizations are actively innovating and making choices that contributes to a sustainable future. Um, at Studio Birthplace, well, how we try to do that, or our mission, uh, is to create awareness about these important and pressing topics through storytelling, uh, to cultivate connection and empathy. So when you, uh, I mean, when Rash Minds told us about the beat your beat plastic pollution campaign and express interest in making a short film about the plastic pollution crisis in Southeast Asia. It was a clear match that spoke directly uh, to our studio's mission. Um, it's an important message. It's a fun project because it's a creative narrative project uh, on a beach. And personally, it's even more special to me uh, personally because it's a message for Southeast Asians and it's set locally. Super, thank you so much. I remember, you know, because we were researching all of the background for 100 Days to Beat Plastic Pollution, one of the things that we wanted to look at was what's currently out there? What, what are people watching already? Um, you know, what, what's for the region? What's outside of the region? And when we were doing our research, we found a lot of things from like Spain and France, uh, Australia. I remember one, for example, which was um, in Spain where they, the lady pulled out an, an enormous paella from the, um, from the oven. But then obviously when you, the, the camera goes in and you're like, oh my goodness, actually the, the prawns are, are pegs. And, and you know, it was always like all, all those uh, rice is all microplastics and and you know instantly you get that visceral feeling of like you know oh my goodness that that mother is about to serve a, a giant plastic paella to her children this is this is clearly wrong right so we were really inspired by that and then really shocked to find actually there's nothing for this region no nothing that's featuring Asian actors or anything you know so and, I'm, and then we were also digging around and be like hey we found studio birthplace and all of the things that you've been working on in relation to uh, Wasteminster with Greenpeace and I thought, you know, these guys surely have to be the, the first port of call in terms of this really impactful storytelling um, that can take these really important messages to the next level, grab people's attention and then not let go um, and keep it in their minds so that they keep being remembered. You know, so I think you've you've done a fantastic job in, in terms of the film and, and how much people, um, it kind of stays with people in that sense, you know, um, because they, they find it so relatable um, because, because and, and it's for this region, right? Um, another question though, when, when we got actually, because, you know, in terms of like behind the scenes, like, can you let us know, like, when you're crafting a film like this, you know, how, how do you even start to plot out like key messages through the story and, and that kind of thing? Um, I think one of the key themes, one of the primary themes that we wanted to highlight was um, our indifference towards the issue, um, how plastic is everywhere, uh, more than we consciously know. We use it, we consume it, and we essentially drown in it. So in the story, um, through the eyes of Aisha, who is our very talented 10 year old actress. Uh, we see her represent a younger generation waking up and seeing the indifference and the mess that we adults created. Um, so 
we we plot key messages to seeing her journey from becoming aware to essentially driving change. So, um, and then when you're, um, you know, I suppose another question in relation to kind of going back again, when I first came to you with the idea, was there ever a kind of thought in your mind like, oh, well, I suppose we could do a fictional story, but we could more kind of do a documentary style or how do you kind of make that choice of like what kind of story that you're going to tell and, and the medium through which you do that? I think documentaries are great um, for in-depth information, um, but however, the straightforward uh, way of reporting uh, tends to attract an audience who are already interested and aware about these topics, uh, from my knowledge. But with the fictional approach, the goal is to, well, our goal is to hook a wider audience in with an engaging narrative and then revealing the message uh, because we feel that this way, uh, information is best retained uh, when, de when delivered with a memorable or emotional story. Cool. And can you maybe talk us a little bit about um, the challenges that we faced as well, right? Because we were trying to do, this is a COVID-19 film, unfortunately, right? Um, so can you just share a little bit about that process and how you, how we together managed to kind of mold the story, the initial story that we really wanted to tell and kind of still end up with a really impactful story, but how we had to kind of navigate that. Right. So we, we first got to talk when it was during the long lockdown. It was right in the middle of it. And while we were developing the film, we had this uh, sort of restrictions in mind. Like we came up with a story where everything was set in the house. So we didn't need to go out. Um, but then, you know, we slowly we heard news of the lockdown being lifted. And so we started to develop a story where we shoot outside. Um, and thankfully, once we once we got the green light, once we hear that filming is uh, permitted, with, you know, with certain licenses uh, and permits uh, that it was possible. Um, so it was kind of good at the right timing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I remember something else in times of when we were making it, um, you had to win me over about the, uh, the soundtrack actually. Because um, initially I was like, no, no, we mustn't have anything that kind of distracts, but actually, I think for me now, the soundtrack is one of the most favorite parts actually that really brings it all together because it does kind of have this haunting slightly, you know, and he's, he's singing about calamity and you're kind of not quite sure, is it, is it, am I supposed to listen to the words when I'm not quite sure, you know? So can you talk us through that? How, how, were you, how are you thinking about the, the importance of audio in a film that doesn't have a, a script in that sense? Right, so I think one, when we developed the film, we didn't have like lyrics in mind. We had the, the, the tone and the feel of the music in mind, and that's what we uh, sort of discussed with our composer about. So the music we wanted was something that was lighthearted, something uh, relaxing, but at the same time a bit haunting because it's going to just oppose uh, the visuals of, of, of the issue. Um, but, but then our composer introduced the lyrics and we thought it, was, it worked perfectly because, of, because it kept the, the lighthearted tone, but it introduced uh, lyrics that were very um, on point with the message that we were trying to deliver. Super cool, thank you. Um, and finally, um, can you talk us through some of the sustainable practices that you um, use when you're filming on set? Um, so this is something we, try our best to do and improve on, on every project. Um, and on this set, everyone brought their own reusable bottles um, and we provided meals without single use plastics. Um, and so that saves us a few trash bags of plastic waste essentially. So it's essentially a set that is single use plastic free. Cool. Actually one more little thing about, you know, just, just generally your feeling actually on why do you and do you think it's important to um, include Southeast Asian actors and cast and crew, et cetera, for a film that is targeted at this region? I think it's representation. I think when people see people they can relate to, locations they can relate to, um, you know, it kind of it, it, it reaches them to the heart, through the heart, um, basically making it more relatable. 
Yes, absolutely. Completely agree. Relatable. And then that increases the empathy. And once you have increased empathy, then you're just that little step closer to actually someone taking that individual action that we're asking them to do to avoid single use plastic whenever they can. Thank you so much. Great stuff. Um, so moving on, we're going to go dive in with our sustainability advocates um, from the region. So we have, remember, Cher and Kathleen and Sydney. Um, I wonder if you guys could all share your thoughts on the film generally um, and how it also resonates to your work. We would love to know more about your own uh, projects, um, but also some thoughts on the film. Um, maybe dive in with uh, Cher first. Hi, um, really nice to be here and um, love the film, by the way. Um, I particularly loved it because it's in Malaysia. Um, and that's where I'm from and that's where we work. Um, and as you say, there's a real um, lack of things that resonate with the communities that we work with. Um, we can show lots of, you know, movies and material about Western nations, as you say, like a paella, but the roti chanai man, uh, you know, just resonates with everyone. That's where we go for breakfast in the morning. Um, so that was brilliant. Uh, and I really like that it wasn't preachy. I think people get preached at all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that was that was really great. And I also loved the fact, and I know it was intentional that it was a child, um, a child who took that step. Um, and it was such a simple step. Um, so that's something else that, that I really liked. I was the other day I was um, I was doing a beach clean with a with a friend of mine who's a conservationist. And as we were kind of depressingly looking through all the bits and pieces that we were picking up. Um, she said to me, you know, she said, the problem is that so many people don't take action because the problem is too big and they don't feel that they'll make a difference. Um, and they feel that if they don't do everything and they don't do everything perfectly, um, they're not gonna make a change. And so this was great because it shows that, I mean, the fact is everyone, lots the masses, lots and lots of people taking lots of little steps is gonna have a big impact. Um, and this film is, you know, it was great. It was great in, in showing that. So I, I really, really um, enjoyed that. Um, I'm really excited. I think one of the first things we asked was, do we, will this come out with um, BM, Bahas Malay, um, subtitles? And you said, yes. So that's brilliant. We're really excited about showing that um, and distributing that around our communities and then getting them to distribute it on. Um, I think, you know, plastic pollution is a, massive problem for us. One of the reasons why we started TIC um, was because of the very obvious human impacts um, that we were seeing. So to give you an idea, um, TIC, the team there since 2018 have picked up more than 26 tons of marine debris. Um, and that's around the Mersing Islands, seven islands around us. Um, and that is not because that was all that there was to pick up. It's because we didn't have enough manpower to pick up more. Um, and in terms of an, another image is um, earlier this year, we had a group of 80 volunteers come up and do a TIC cleanup. And in two hours, 80 people picked up two tons of rubbish. Wow. And that's just off one beach um, on an island that we clean all the time. Mm. So, you know, that's the, that's the scale of, of, of the problem. Um, Someone else also says, always says, you know, beach cleans are great, but they're a little bit like um, mopping up the floor when the tap is still running and the bath is overflowing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of the work that we do in this film will contribute to that is um, outreach into communities um, and working with businesses. So um, at the moment we're part of our team, three of our team are working full time on a project um, which is actually funded by UNDP and Ministry of Finance Malaysia on Pulau Besar, which is um, one of the islands of Mersing. Um, and that's integrated island waste management. And one component of that is um, waste at source and solutions of waste, especially on an off-grid island, because um, there is no kind of municipal way of, of getting rid of waste, um, which contributes to the issue at hand. Um, and I think what we're finding is that um, it's so important to really spend time with the communities um, and the businesses. So there are resorts on the island 
and kind of co-brainstorm ideas. Um, so it's understanding the data, understanding the problem, and we're lucky to have a kind of 18 month program to be able to do that. Um, but understanding the problem and working together with people to come up with solutions so that there's actual ownership um, for what comes out. But this is really great because this shows that a little girl who gets a plastic container to buy her eye bundle can actually um, make a change. So we love that. Um, yeah. Awesome, thank you so much. I mean, we've spoken before about all of the unwelcome visitors in the form of all this trash that just kind of keeps washing up, you know, and it's nothing that you cannot turn it off. And it's just something that sadly on, on the island you have to deal with. So thank you so much for your efforts because, you know, it's it's something that sadly is, is created not on your island and it just comes and comes and comes. And it is gonna continue to be relentless unless we stop it at source, right? So we've got to get people to just stop creating the waste in the first place. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, moving quickly to uh, Kathleen, um, can you tell us some more about um, the things that you've been up to and also what you think about the film? Yeah, uh, lovely to see everyone. Um, firstly, what a great film and congratulations to the team. Um, Kay mentioned that I'm representing coastal natives and one of the things that keeps us up at night is how to create aha moments that inspire people to change behavior. So this film hits the nail on the head. Um, firstly, it creates a context that's relevant to us here in Southeast Asia. Um, as we've been talking about, there are so many details that felt really familiar uh, from the raffia string to the bandung drink that she just mentioned. And I think seeing things we're familiar with, you know, really helps us to connect how we're part of the story. Um, I also thought that the tone of the film is very clever. It doesn't shy away from the issue. Um, we mentioned that it, it, you know, it has these haunting elements, but at the same time, as Sean mentioned, it holds the issue a little lightly in terms of being lighthearted with a few amusing moments as well, which I think viewers entering this space um, might need. So um, a, a bit about Coastal Natives, it's a Rumor Foundation project in Singapore that we started because we really wanted to share our love for the ocean and raise awareness about how important it is to our way of living. An idea that really uh, subscribe to is that you can't love something and become a champion for it if you don't know it exists. So our mission is to inspire new ocean lovers and conservationists. And we do that through organizing events that we hope develop wonder for the ocean, as well as um, collaborate on creative projects that we hope capture the interest of people new to the cause area. And, and I think capturing interest is exactly what this film does, which is why it really resonates so much. And I think like Cher, I hope we can help amplify this film um, with our audiences. Um, one of the activities that we started during COVID um, to bring our community together, like Cher, um, is the humble beach cleanup. And what's interesting with the beach cleanups is that in the last quarter, we've seen an overwhelming increase of requests for cleanups uh, from schools and corporates to government agencies, and we even had a military service reach out. Um, and it's been so overwhelming that we've created a new workshop called Beach Cleanups 101 to guide new organizers so that they can sustain the effort and not just do it once. Um, I think this really shows an increased awareness of the plastic crisis, but also the motivation to get out there and something for all of us here to leverage as organizations uh, create opportunities for their people to bond. Awesome, thank you. And um, I know also you've also, um, been involved in um, ocean film festivals and that kind of stuff. Why, why the medium of film? What is it do you think that kind of grabs people? And there's something that you said right at the start that I thought um, really resonated when you said that it created a visceral um, experience. And I think that's uh, really important to get people to feel. Um, if we can't feel, then we're not motivated to act. And I think that idea of loving something and understanding how it impacts us is important for us to, to create behavior change. I, behavior change is a hard one to crack, and I think there's so many people trying to work on it. But film and storytelling is, is a super important tool that I think that we can use. Awesome. Thank you so much. And moving to Sydney, um, yeah, can you share us more about, you know, what projects you're up to and also what you think about the film? Yeah, awesome. Well, what I love about the film is like the way that it starts, it shows off how, you know, how normal we all think that this is and how integrated into our lives it is, because that that's the reality and people don't notice it all the time. You know, I even one time 
a couple of years ago, I was sitting in a, in a grab car and the guy, the driver was asking me what I do. I told him what I do and he's like, oh, so plastic pollution is a bad thing, isn't it? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> look on the side of the road that we're driving on, it's everywhere. And I, it, it, that, that was just mind blowing, blowing. That was pivotal to me. Mm. And I'm just like, people are very unaware of this. Yes. And yeah, I feel like this does give a good light to people showing you know how normalized it is when it shouldn't be and I do love how it shows that the little kid ended up realizing it for themselves and teaching their own father about it so you know it shows that little people like not little people sorry little kids because I'm still small I'm I'm, I'm short <laughs> <laughs> um anyway young young people do have quite a great impact and along with the music it shows it really sort of strikes you so I do love that about it and I, I when I saw the the boy buried in the sand I laughed because it was kind of funny and cute <laughs> like crab yeah so that, that, that's what I love about the film and after seeing lots of you know I did a panel for Seaspiracy as well that they you know they also focus on you know films like that you know it's a very long film it's very big and out there but you hardly find any films focused on the places that are so heavily impacted by it, such as Southeast Asia. So it is great to see representation of these areas and their daily life, how it is here. And yeah, so I, I do, the other thing I do love about the film is that it, you highlight how it wasn't mostly cleaning up. It was mostly changing your own actions to make a difference because as Sher, Sher said, you know, you can feel like you're mopping up the, the water when you should be turning off the tap that is creating the overflow, mm -hmm. which is pretty much why the Sea Monkey Project is not heavily focused on, well, we're barely focused on beach cleanups because there's a, a lot of incredible organizations that are working on that and they're absolutely killing it, like you guys as well. And we are going to put out, or we have been, we still are and in the future we are putting our focus into you know turning that tap off and that's great representation I find in the film as well you know not only cleaning up but also changing your actions so that's why in the sea monkey project you know we do recycle plastic or well, upcycle but you know recycling is never going to be the answer to the plastic pollution problem so at the end of everything there's education so like just today the reason I was rushing to get to this event was because I just came back from an international school on the other side of Penang Island where we were doing some filming and working with the kids who are running their own recycling project and they are teaching their community and the people in their schools about why you should reduce your plastic usage and uh, clean up a bit more. It was really inspiring to see how these these kids in their own school really taken on adopted this project you know taken their own hands and really brought it to life and hearing them talk about their future plans is very inspiring and yeah we have uh, quite a few projects coming up that are mostly to do with keeping people educated but also making sure the plastic doesn't end up into the ocean in the first place uh, that's our, our big goal with these um, when we do have a you know beach cleanup coming up we will definitely partake in it but yeah, um, we'll, we'll let the beach cleanup side to you amazing guys. We tend to focus more on the preventing getting the ocean in the first place. And that's why I love the film. It, it balances them both. So that's a, a vague idea of the sort of things that the CMAC project is working on. I hope that gives oh, a bit yeah, of Thank you so much. I mean, I've got another question for you, Sydney though. Um, do you think that there's a disconnect with, when you work with the kids on the, on the project, do they have a disconnect in terms of like, but how does it get into the sea? I don't see anyone going, putting it directly in the sea. Uh, and I, I've certainly never put, you know, my bottle in the sea. I put it in the bin. So, you know, how, how is all this stuff getting there? Is, do you think that there needs to be kind of better education in terms of like how it actually ends up in the sea in the first place? Oh, absolutely. Honestly, because... That, that's a big thing that I find in Australia and Western countries, which is why, you know, people always say, oh, Australia is so good at recycling their plastic waste. They're not. They're, they're not off the hook. No country is fully off the hook of the problem. Honestly, you know, I'm not going to give Australia a special pass just because I'm Australian. Honestly. Yeah. So they 
you see it a lot in Australia. People say, you know, we put that plastic in the bin, it goes to the recycling plants, recycled, we're all good. You know, we're good, good country at that. Uh, no, that, that's not how it works. So, you know, there's a lack of education in, you know, the middle class area with how plastic gets into the ocean. And that's also linking to the lack of education in lesser fortunate, uh, poorer village communities with how it ends up into the environment and how it affects the nature and their livelihood in the very grand scheme of things with plastic pollution. So with the schools specifically, they it is quite relatively close to the ocean and they do actually have plastic collection points throughout the local village. And they are developing a, a new collection system, a nice big bin, and they make a competition out of it with their school houses on who can collect the most clean plastic to cool. be recycled rather than letting it go into nature. And when they started the whole project, I was invited to be a guest speaker for their club. And that got to kick them off with some inspiration, a bit of education about where plastic goes and how it's such a big problem. So yeah, that that is, they're very switched on kids and they're very passionate because, you know, they're part of the, the eco committee and the, and the, I don't know, there's so many different clubs that they got going on there. And yeah, it's quite inspiring to see these kids work and there needs to be a lot more education going around, honestly. So yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. I, I completely agree. Um, and just kind of closing then, if, if, if Sydney says lack of education and we say we need more, raising awareness, et cetera, et cetera, amongst young people, um, Kathleen and Cher, anything else? Is there anything else that needs to be done to, to make people realise what they need to do to avoid single use plastic, to ensure they're taking everyday action in that sense? Um, Kathleen, anything? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's important for all of us to realise that uh, we all have a role to play in perpetuating the system and, and so we do have the power to change and change starts uh, with us, uh, you know, whether it's single use plastics or whether it's our role at school or our role at the office, you know, all of these um, you know, our spheres of influence are so important and we have uh, an ability to, to create change. Um, but I think uh, beyond just the bottom up impact, uh, I think the top down impact is extremely important as well. And, um, you know, governments have a role to play in terms of systems change, whether that's uh, incentivizing good behavior or punishing bad behavior or allowing a level playing field. And I think us as individuals also have that ability, um, you know, depending on the countries that, uh, you know, listeners are from to try and navigate and, and uh, show support for leaders that, that we believe uh, should be there. Super, thank you so much. So lack of education and uh, role of governments. Um, share any last thoughts in terms of what else could be done for this region? Yeah, I totally agree with both um, and definitely lack of gov um, government support plus um, then corporates also playing their part, that's one point. To go back down to the ground, I think one of the issues that we always grapple with is how to make plastic pollution, how to make the environment a priority, right? Because the communities that we work with have just been COVID and no revenues for the last few years because tourism was kind of dead and we work in a tourism area. Um, another point is that now coming out of COVID inflation, right, cost of living, um, I think the chicken satay stall no longer sells chicken satay in Mersing Town. We just got a message about that, you know, and people are really worried about, about rising costs. So how does this become, um, how does this become kind of something that people think about? And I think it's really important for us to be able to put forward actionable solutions. So this is where the film is great in that it just showed like, you know, you didn't have to, it wasn't grand gestures. It was two um, plastic Tupperware bottles um, and affordable um, and doable. So I think, I think providing solutions that are easily accessible is really, really important for the area. Brilliant, thank you so much. Wonderful, we have our final speaker, absolutely last but not least, Isabel. So um, on the role of government bodies and large corporations and all of these interesting points that um, the uh, sustainability advocates have raised. So as you know, the film has a strong focus on the power of individual and collective action. Um, from UNET's perspective, what are your thoughts on plastic? Let's kick off with that. Um, I think first on, on the film itself, um, I, I think I just, I think there have been a lot of good points. 
uh, made by all the, the panelists. Uh, it's a very timely uh, film in the context of, you know, this week is World, uh, World Environment Day. It's also the week of uh, Stockholm plus 50, that's 50 years after the, uh, the, the, the first movement on, on environment and sustainable development uh, was globally reached out to. Um, and um, nobody thought that, you know, plastic uh, would be a problem that it is now, 50 years later. Um, so I think this, uh, the film uh, is coming at a time uh, when these messages are, are, are being uh, put out. Uh, but, but the point that struck me was, I'm a Malaysian, um, I work in Thailand, and, um, and increasingly, you know, to, to reach um, the consumers and the users and the decision makers, um, films like these that, that, uh, are, are, that you can relate to, to in your day to day uh, are more and more important. Uh, because people can say, ah, that's what I know that place, or I can relate to that place, or is this problem happening where I am familiar with? And, um, and also from the eyes of a child, um, you know, children always in, in any film or documentary uh, also um, attract people or bring people's attention to the message. And so uh, it's not just timely, but I hope that um, it can also be um, distributed to schools and, um, and other places where children can also, you know, take the message back um, to their families, to their friends, uh, because they're, they're powerful voices um, to, to take it on. And, um, and I also um, will think that if we could um, continue to build on this um, local visuals, uh, local languages, uh, and so it touches uh, people who are touching and uh, addressing this issue or raising the awareness in the countries, even more local uh, in, in local places. But of course, um, we can't let the child's imagination be real. So, so the, the thing is, uh, how can we also show uh, solutions that could have actually, uh, will change uh, to make sure that this, uh, this does not become a, a reality. Uh, but what's more important is that uh, from UNEP's uh, perspective is that everything we, we have to do is, is not an individual silo action, it's a, a collective responsibility, a collective action and so, you know, everybody in some way has a role to play from policymakers, the businesses, the research, uh, the communities, uh, the informal sector, the youth, um, consumer based organizations, and the public. All of us, uh, each of us has that responsibility. So, you know, following on from the um, 100 days to beat plastic pollution, uh, uh, homing on something like this from the eyes of a child. Um, is, is an important way of uh, catalyzing uh, behavioral change. Thank you, Kay. Super, thank you so much. So interesting. Um, and what about, I mean, do you have insights into how we might be able to, to motivate the public, though, to continue taking that action so that we can secure this sustainable future for our planet? Like I said, you know, plastic has become everybody's problem, but you know, can also be uh, complacency, right? Um, and um, and after a while, you need a you need a nudge, or, or you need some chaos, or 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 a wake up call. And I, I think this happened during the COVID. Uh, but as we also saw um, in our Sea of Solutions forum end of last year on the Sea Circular Project, that um, you know many entrepreneurs and individuals um, have actually been doing what they, they felt was important. Uh, that whilst there was an increase in the use of plastic, uh, there has to be a continued attention to, to reduce plastic. For example, I think like myself, many of us were you know, kind of uh, stunned by the amount of packaging because of you know, the way you order food uh, and the way it is then um, you know, disposed of. Um, and, then, and yet on the other hand, we did see that uh, there were a lot of innovation and approaches. And I think this whole concept of startups as well um, so, so I think in terms of motivating the public, sometimes it's also giving recognition, uh, like I said, uh, demonstrating champions, letting the champions speak for themselves, children, uh, bringing the attention to, to children, adults to adults, and the whole business community, because there are so many parts of the value chain that are different roles for businesses and policymakers. But also for the public to also play a role in that, because you know, the public invests in some of the business. Uh, the public can also uh, benefit from actually having a voice uh, through the investments of these businesses um, in the way they decide which uh, portfolio of businesses they want to invest in. 
So there are many ways the public, you know, whether it's uh, uh, from children to, you know, um, uh, people working, um, daily lifestyles, or even, uh, you know, those who are involved in, uh, in business areas can make a difference. Because um, this is not just a, an environmental issue, it's, uh, it's beyond that. But there is, it's also about solutions. Um, so, you know, we were, we were discussing um, in the last few weeks that, um, you know, if we keep on showing um, these, these uh, challenges uh, in individuals, um, um, then, you know, is it always doom and gloom, but maybe if we can throw the balance of, um, uh, of the public seeing, you know, uh, what, what, is, what is better well-being or a better balance of lifestyle, about health, health touches people personally. So you can link the, the problem to also solutions. Um, and for example, not just the collective responsibility, uh, but solutions of engaging communities, um, continuously emphasizing the need for science, for data, um, and also, you know, innovation. There's so much of the, the plastic, uh, if you've seen upcycling and others, uh, is about innovation. And also how we reward this and how we publicize this and people feel motivated. Um, and investors can also be uh, investing in this innovation and, and technology. Um, we keep talking about consumers needed to adjust our consumption choices. But again, this also has to be about, um, you know, about uh, what you can do and demonstrate solutions. So I think these are some of the things we can do together. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. It's so, so interesting that you highlight the role of um, corporations in that in terms of innovation and governments as well to support those innovations to, to bring them uh, to the mass public. Um, and, you know, frankly, you know, as we all sign of easing out of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, let us not forget um, that as part of the 100 Days to Beat Plastic Pollution campaign, we were very much focused on the fact that this is a potential plastic pandemic. You know, they, we, there's so many, um, at, at one stage we, we looked at the statistics saying there was three million masks a minute that are going and um, being dumped in the ocean. Um, think about all of the, the plastic packaging for all of the, every single COVID test that has been done in the world. And I, I, I just, you know, really hope that you're not going to see in a few more, you know, months or in the coming years before 2024, um, all of these, uh, you know, like, like a little seahorse carrying around a COVID-19 test, for example, right? The, the iconic image of the seahorse carrying around the cotton bud, you know, is that going to be re replaced by, by COVID waste? And, and we really must make sure that that is not the case. Um, so we really have to stop it um, at, at source. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much. We have 15 minutes left and I'm very pleased to say we've got some really interesting questions from the audience. Um, so the first one is, uh, we've heard a lot of the impact of plastic pollution. What do you think this, uh, sorry, do you think this largely stems from parents and the older generation not understanding how dire the situation is? Or do you think older people do not care because it does not immediately affect them today? So, okay, the role of parents and older generations. Um, maybe um, share. I mean, so you're, you're a parent yourself. How, what do you think about this? I was going to ask you how old is old? Because <laughs> when I think of parents, I think of my 77 year old parents. <laughs> I don't think of myself. Um, True. But amazingly, actually, um, if you look at our parents' generation, we didn't have this amount of plastic. They didn't have that amount of plastic, right? We, we didn't go, I don't recall young, when we were younger going and getting takeaway and just having kind of that plastic container and that, we used to go with our canteens um, and, and buy stuff. So I, th I think that, I, I think that, so that it's not that older generation's fault. Um, is it our fault? I think it's I, th I think it's a culture it's a culture and it's a behavior I don't think we should be pointing fingers at mm -hmm. anyone right now um because blaming doesn't really get you anywhere um I think if we can just keep raising awareness and then work together um to find a solution that's going to be a, a lot better than than trying to work out whose fault it is Cool. Um, Sydney, as a kind of, I mean, you're, you're still at school, right? So, and you, you're very much kind of still under your parents in that sense, you know? So what do you think? Do you think that your, the parents, you know, your parents could have a better role? Um, or what about your grandparents? You know, what, do you think that everyone's on board with this or that the older generations could do more? 
um, and, and how is that kind of taken from a kind of younger generation perspective? Oh, yeah, well, I was thinking, you know, as Cher said, you, you definitely cannot blame anyone and I'm definitely not going to, but I feel like, you know, when, when our parents and our grandparents were younger, um, yeah, as already said, you know, they <clears throat> had the canteens, tiffins, things like that. And I was talking to someone today, actually, I interviewed someone today saying how back when she was younger, she had milk, the milk bottles being refilled and put at her doorstep. And I was saying, hmm, I'd like to experience that. That, that would be pretty, a pretty nice thing to have, you know, in our society still. And I think they are doing that again in England. I'm not sure. But anyway, so I feel like, you know, they didn't start off with plastic. It's slowly integrated into their lives. And I guess as a parent, if you want to talk about parents specifically, you know, as a parent, you can be very busy. It's very tiring, of course, as a parent. So using plastic is very easy and convenient way to get get by, you know. So and, you know, growing up uh, into plastic slowly, you know, slowly gets integrated into everyday lives. And but at the same time, you don't really have you don't have too much of a choice if you don't have very good access to alternatives because everything is packaged in plastic. Everything, you know, is made of plastic somehow. You know, our, our laptops have plastic in it. We can't avoid that. So it's just so integrated into our lifestyle that a lot of people, they either don't have the energy to notice it or it's a cultural thing or you're just used to it. But at the same time, one of the reasons why I'm not, a big fan of Australia, living in Australia, you know, no shit. I mean, yeah, no shade specifically to Australia, but I found that people there are quite narrow-minded. It's a cultural thing, I'm pretty sure, but they don't, they're not very open-minded. So it's very hard to change their mindset on things. My grandma, she, she's, she's amazing. She's a trooper, but she only just recently started bringing her own bags to the shops and she still forgets sometimes, but you can't blame her. <laughs> she's, she's still my grandma, but she's making an effort because I've tried to inspire her and educate her. So yeah, you, I mean, you can't just specifically blame parents. You know, everyone has lacking education. Most, some people are lacking alternatives. So it's not just uh, one problem, of course. It's, it's ways that we don't even know about as well. Super, thanks so much. I mean, we mustn't also forget that the um, actual inventor of the plastic bag intended it for it to be almost be a bag for life, you know, to be used many, many times over. Never, ever uh, actually did he intend for it to be used one time and then thrown away. Um, and in fact, at the time when he invented it, um, it was because uh, it was seen as a better alternative to chopping down all the trees for paper bags, right? So, you know, you have to ask yourself, how did we get here, right? So, um, so yes, I mean, we, we've all talked about, you know, lack of education and, and ways and educating people in new ways that we need to now act, um, given the fact of the scale of the problem. Um, so thank you. Uh, what's, we've got another one here. Um, the film definitely brings the shock uh, factor into play um, and, and is effective in catching attention and uh, restarting the conversation on plastic problem. Um, are there plans to follow up film, particularly something that focuses on actions and solutions? Uh, kudos to the creatives behind this. So I think Sean, that's probably more uh, directed at you. Do you have any um, other plans in terms of follow up films or, or do you think that there could be a natural uh, follow up to this in terms of uh, focusing on actions and so solutions? I think we're always looking for opportunities to uh, create more more films around the issue. I think this is, I think, our fourth or fifth piece on plastic. Uh, definitely, we're, we're going to continue to look for uh, more ways and more opportunities to develop more stories. Excellent. So get in touch with Sean if you have any ideas. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, um, I've got another one um, in relation to... Ah, so yeah, picking up on something that actually Isabel said in relation to kind of, um, you know, the, the scourge of, of uh, takeaways and that kind of stuff. Do you have any tips on how to make it a habit to say no to single use plastics, especially when it, we live in a society that's fast paced and taking food away is really the norm? Isabel, do you want to kind of um, share some tips there? Um, I think we saw it in the during the, you know, the COVID and I think people's I've got so um, used to this lifestyle, you know, and um, 
So I, I think the onus, as we've seen, is on, on, on everybody. This is a collective action. I mean, you see there are some um, uh, companies who actually um, will now encourage you to bring your own containers and they will actually give it to your own. So, so there are a lot of opportunities you pay a lot of, a lot of attention. Uh, it also means that um, you have to make the effort. I mean, you know, that if you're going out somewhere, carry uh, your own container with you. Or, you know, I remember uh, before COVID, they were all <coughs> given all these different, uh, you know, uh, metal straws and, you know, and then we forgot all about it. So sometimes it's about reviving those, those things again. Um, so, so I think that there's a lot of people who are passionate about uh, ending plastic pollution, who are in the businesses that are actually um, are providing, uh, creating the plastic waste, and they are doing their bit to help reduce that. Um, but um, on the other hand, you know, those who are also passionate as a consumer can also educate those uh, businesses and say, I, I only want to use, if you please give it to me, and then they ask you, why are you doing this? Then you educate them, right? Um, and it's same like many supermarkets here in Thailand who, who were actually using paper bags have gone back to plastic. So if one keeps telling back, why are you bringing back plastic? So it's a conversation, I think, that, that, that needs to happen and people need to be brave and uh, sort of um, uh, not feeling shy uh, to, to ask those questions. But, but I think the other question, the thing is, it's all about language issues. Uh, how do you explain to different people? You know, everybody's got a different context. Um, I mean, the earlier conversation, like parents, I mean, their parents whose livelihood sometimes, you know, just, just to raise fun money and keep the family going, like in the, in the food business, you need, you know, they say, what, what, what else can I do? I, I can't afford anything else. So I, I think it's about understanding the different lifestyles, the, um, the economy groups, the uh, income groups and being 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 very um, sensitive to that uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, it's a collective action um, that we have to do. But I think it um, it means that if we all do our part, um, you know, uh, at least to get back to where we were two three years ago uh, before COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I think um, that's exactly why we focused on um, the habit forming um, in, in 100 Days to Beat Plastic Pollution. So the whole premise was just choose one single use item that you can actually avoid um, and, and replace it with that reusable. But please try to keep that habit for over 100 days because research shows that it takes 66 days on average for a habit to become automatic. So if you can reach 66 days, it's going to be so unlikely then or less likely that you will then leave home without your, your um, reusable bag or your reusable bottle, that kind of stuff, you know. So um, really try to, as Isabel said, just choose even one thing and make that a habit that you can um, then, then it just becomes part of your everyday life. So that in the same way, your everyday habit that you always go to, to collect your uh, delivery in um, food in your, uh, uh, you know, bring your own takeout container, try it. And actually, you know, I, that's exactly what I did. It was, it was the one uh, thing that I was just kind of still addicted to in that sense of like, you know, I'd, I'd already got my bottle, I've got my, my reusable bag, but yes, occasionally we were still doing the, oh, you know, chicken rice delivery or something like that at the weekend. It's like, and actually just going out and buying those tin cats and saying, you know what, I'm actually going to get on my bike and, you know, have a bit of exercise, go down there with my tin cats and, and see what happens. And I was thinking, oh no, they're going to tell me off because I'm being annoying, that I'm, I, you know, I'm asking for something out of their, their usual, uh, you know, service, but they were really, really encouraging. Like, oh cool, yeah, I know, yeah. I was like, oh, do you know how to un undo the clips? Like, yes, yes, I know already. So I thought, oh, it was actually a really easy experience. So don't be afraid to take that little step. Um, and change that habit up if you can. Um, but linking to also what Isabel touched upon at the end of what she was saying in, in relation to, you know, there being this sense of privilege perhaps, right? So there's a, con a question, and I think it's gonna have to be our last question, I'm afraid. Um, it's, could you please expand on the correlation between choosing a plastic-free life, but also the privilege of actually being able to choose that plastic free life. So in that sense, you know, I always come back to little examples that people may not know about, for example, for uh, in the Philippines, um, you know, the levels of poverty are so bad there that actually in some for some people, they can't even afford a simple shampoo bottle. 
they have to buy their shampoo in sachets in little like like it looks like a a, a ketchup uh, um, sachet from from McDonald's for example that's how they wash their hair so they don't they, they it's like you're asking me to avoid something and I, I don't have an option so do we have any kind of final thoughts around this you know keeping you know sustainable living not as a privilege of the rich um, any kind of final thoughts around this I mean Isabel do you have any kind of thoughts to kick us off yeah, I think this goes back to the whole poverty alleviation. You, you, you can't sort of say every action for plastic, ending plastic has got to be linked to an action for the way you use plastic. You know, if the, if you've got to go back to the what's the driver of the of the behavior, right? And if it's poverty, and that's why, you know, SDG 1 is about alleviate poverty. And, and, and how do you do that, right? You know, in the marginalized communities, um, um, in, um, uh, you know, in, for women getting more, employment, you, you've got to address the poverty issue, right? Um, and then you can make that choice. Um, and, and, and that's the biggest uh, priority at the end of the day. If you address the poverty, there are many other, um, you know, uh, outcomes that are affected because poverty is the driver of, of that problem. Um, then you can start addressing the uh, issues. So you've got to be very sensitive uh, because one of the issues that we look at in plastic is working with the informal sector, right? Why, why, why is the informal sector so engaged? But it's linked to poverty, right? Right. Um, but you know, but how about actually, you know, uh, you know, getting them and giving them salary payments, some way of bringing them together, and not seeing just seeing them. Oh, is there somebody out there who's taking getting rid of the of the plastic? So a large part of our work is how to to make the informal sector a key part of the value chain, but also valued and, and, and their poverty is alleviated. So, so I think it goes back to the, the driver, you know, you can change consumptions, you can change your behavior, um, but um, you know, one of our studies has showed the biggest amount of plastic leaking into the Mekong River is actually the sachets, right? Many of these communities along the river or further upstream are, are linked to poverty alleviation. So those are the kind of projects I need to invest in and do more of. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're out of time, but absolutely just to echo what Isabel said, you know, it, it is a very difficult problem. And, you know, we do genuinely feel uh, the plight of people. You, you know, you can't look after the planet unless you've looked after yourself in that sense, right? So, um, yes, uh, more actions from governments um, to, to help alleviate the poverty problem is absolutely key as well to, to helping us end plastic pollution. Um, so, sadly, we have come to the end of our panel discussion. I really want to be so thankful to our wonderful panellists. Um, I think, um, and, th and thank you so much to the audience for joining us. I think we had over, over 100 people at one point. It was really, really excellent. Thank you so much. Please do remember to check out the public release of plastic on YouTube channels of UNEP and Mesh Minds, and please share your comments. We really would love to know how is it, has it affected you? Has it uh, touched you? Uh, and please share widely. On behalf of our panel, I wish you a very pleasant evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. Great talking to you guys. Bye. Thank you. Hi.